Hey everybody, this is Alexander Fitzgerald or Sassanato doing another one of my webinars for Jonathan Little. Today we are going to be discussing exploitative continuation bet sizing, refining our basics. Why should you change your bet sizes? Why you should change your bet sizes? 90 plus percent of your opponents in an HPT or in a low stakes cash games have no idea who you are. They are generally playing their hand and not getting too calibrated. Versus players like this, you can manipulate them with some basic bet changes. Today I'm going to show you how to exploit basic regulars so you can make more money. So the truth is guys, with the vast majority of opponents, they're more or less playing their cards in their fixed strategy. And if you know what those fixed strategies tend to be, and they tend to be the same ones all over the world, uh, just because people tend to learn poker the same way, you can manipulate them somewhat. So we're gonna talk about that today. But what about balancing is something a lot of people ask. Balancing is important when you're playing against higher level opponents. I, I, I was lucky enough to make a final table in Prague uh, at the butt end of 2016, for example. And there I had to do a lot of balancing because versus very educated opponents, there's no C betting 100% of the time. But it, it's also important to be balancing when you play the same people every day. And in WSOP, 2Ks and higher, Euro 1Ks and higher, and cash games will require, require balancing uh, just because you're going to be playing against the same people every day. But for the vast majority of people, you only get so many hands with them. It's going to be about 40 or 50. And if they've never really seen you, and that, that has to go with cash games or tournaments as well, if they've never really seen you, in those 40 and 50 hands, they're going to have their way, they're going to react, and that's going to be it. And we can manipulate them. This playbook, I use this playbook often when I'm playing against people the first time. It's been very useful in stateside WPTs up to 3.5Ks. And most tournaments in Vegas, uh, the higher stakes Venetians, that, that's when people start attacking your C-bats a little bit more. And obviously WCP 2Ks and higher. Uh, it works great in tournaments up to $200 weekday tournaments in uh, online tournaments. So online, if you're playing Sunday majors, you're fine. Uh, if you're playing up to 109s during the weekdays, you're fine. But those 162 $200 daily tournaments, that that's where people start attacking you online. So I wouldn't use this stuff as much there. And again, it has to do with the player base. If it's a very educated player base, which is more rare than people realize, they're going to be attacking CBATs quite frequently. Uh, but the vast majority of even regs that make a little money, the way they make their money is they open when people are unlikely to 3-bet them. They 3-bet when people are unlikely to 4-bet them. And they have a pretty good C-betting strategy themselves. If they call you from the big blind, for example, maybe they're just looking to hit a piece of the flop and that's where we can get a little something. But there's different ways to go about this. Let's let's take a look at let's take a look at a hypothetical situation. So here uh, you have 10-7 of diamonds on the button. You raise to two and a half times the big blind. The big blind calls you. The board comes eight of clubs, four of diamonds, three of spades. It gets checked to you. Of these options, which one would you like to take? Right, uh, you're gonna get a few extra seconds because I had a little technical difficulty there. Somebody in the chat asked, what is an HPT? That was an example of a mid-stakes poker tour in the United States. That's the Heartland Poker Tour, mid-stakes poker tour, WSOPC, all of those apply, this will apply in. So we got a wide range of answers in the chat which I'm gonna put away right now because my ADD prevents me from reading and talking at the same time. Uh, you could even bet larger. Why do you think we should bet larger there? So the, the first one we're gonna analyze is betting 66 to 75% pot. And you'll notice most people bet half pot, but 
I put 66 or 75. Now, why is that? Let me ask you something. When you continuation bet here, what is the most important thought? 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 Anyone want to guess in the chat what the most important thing is to think of here? All right, I see a few people got it. Now, the reason, guys, I hammered on this so much, so I, uh, long story short, I put together a playbook for my students that was very successful with a lot of them. And then with certain students who were just as smart as the other ones, I noticed they weren't being as successful. And that really confused me. Because some of these guys were so intelligent, I wasn't even in their zip code. And eventually, so I did some reading. I was trying to figure out why do people, why can people perform well when they study and during simulations, but not so much in the field. And something I found that was shared by a lot of elite performers is the focus on one, two, or three items. So Navy SEALs, for example, in those guys, some of them are multilingual demolition experts, bodybuilders, right? Like if there's anybody who can remember anything, it would be those guys. Well, when, they're, when they go into the field, they only are given one, two, or three things to remember. Uh, if any of you follow American football, Bill Belichick, uh, the head coach of the New England Patriots, probably the most successful dynasty of all time in the NFL, when he is at halftime and he's giving people things to remember for the second half, he has a rule that it has to be three things. It can't be more than three things. It can be one thing, two things, or three things, but it can't be four. And I find we get more results in No Limit Hold'em when we focus on specific thoughts, okay? Because let's be honest, we've all looked at this situation a hundred times before, and there's a lot of things to look at. One person in the chat said, could he possibly check raise me? Uh, what am I trying to set up on the turn and river? Uh, does that board hit his range or my range more? All of that stuff is great, but we can start with one thought that if we understand this question and the answer of it, it makes everything else superfluous, not as big of a deal. That's where we should start from. Now, obviously, if you get a more complex opponent, you do have to broaden out the thoughts you are thinking to become a little bit more exacting in your ways. But for the vast majority of poker hands, we don't have to go that com complicated. I still use what we're going to talk about here, even in Atlantic City WPTs and whatnot. So you want to see bet to fold out high cards. The biggest question to ask yourself here is how can I get rid of the high cards? And I bet a lot of you answered that. You were saying, how can I get him to just fold with when he missed this board? Yeah, high cards, okay, different phrasing, but the same thing. Now here's my question. You want to see bet to fold out high cards, right? Will betting half pot do that? If you know, tell me, because I don't know. A lot of guys will call with their ace highs of any kind with a half pot bet when there's two wheel cards out there, others will fold. It's a little more likely, actually much more likely, they'll fold if I bet bigger, and obviously less likely they'll fold if I bet smaller. Let's say I bet this much, 450. How often does this need to work, guys? What do you do mathematically to figure out how often this works? This is one of the first things I learned when I started learning poker. Very beginning. This is the beginning of your poker studies. Well, you do 450, the amount you're risking, divided by the pot you're going to get back 
when he folds. Uh, because that 450 doesn't go off into the ether. It comes back to you if uh, you're right and he folds. So you do 450 divided by 1080 here. And you're going to find that your bet as a complete bluff needs to work 41.6 repeating percent of the time. And if anybody is a little puzzled why it's an uneven number there, remember the ante is 10 here. So the reason you bet this large is because if you get the guy to fold high cards on most boards without two cards nine or higher, uh, then you're printing money. But let me say that, that was a little confusing. If the board does not have two cards nine or higher, then generally the person has mostly high cards. If you get him to fold those high cards, almost any bet up to the size of the pot will be profitable. Many basic players will fall for the tactic I just showed you. Their whole life, they have seen half pot size bets. You put out a slightly larger bet, a lot of guys will go, huh, that's weird. And then they muck their high card, which is all we want. That's it, we're not expecting them to fold pairs. That's a big ask but maybe just a bear ace, right? That doesn't have a gut shot. Hell, I still have guys in WPTs that fall for this tactic, guys. I would not teach it to you if I did not use it myself. And this is something you can bring up all the time with satellite winners or like okay regs that are used to dealing with half pot size bets. Oh, if you're, a, if you're an older gentleman or lady, they're just gonna think you have the nuts when you bet bigger. Actually, if they fold, you should apply, you should beef that up. Right after they fold, just go, I hate pocket jacks or something like that. That is an awesome image to have. Now, if you had to pick another answer here, which one would it be? There is one other exploitative play here, which requires a bit more finesse. Does anyone know what it is? Carlos says, I'm not able to see other people's comments. Uh, Carlos, that's because people are writing in the questions tab and that's not a community thing. Why is my timer being so mean? There it is, I got it. Okay guys. Just so you know, I just got a note that says we're at a capacity crowd here. So congratulations, guys. That's my first capacity crowd. All right, time is up. One second, guys. I'm fighting with the webinar. You would bet 33% of the pot. Now, so let's say you bet 200 here into 630. And he calls. The turn is the queen of hearts. Now what do you do? I love how active you guys are in the chat. Look how into this you are. A lot of different answers here too, which is great because it shows this isn't common poker wisdom. It's not something we discuss enough. All right. You would bet just a little over half pot. Anything over half pot would be good. Why would I do that? Well, let's go back to the flop. When we bet that small and he calls, what do you think he is calling with? What do we think he's calling with? Let's make this a group activity. Well, now he's probably calling me with all of his ace highs because, come on, guys, we all fall for this tiny bet. We have a high card. We feel weak folding. I know all about this play, and I'll tell you what. If I have ace seven here and someone bets 200, I feel really silly folding. 
But the problem is, what happens if the guy calls with ace high? We all fall for this tiny bet. We have a high card. We feel weak folding. And that's when we get them. Or that's when they get us, rather. Because that turn comes, and it's anything but an ace, and we fire anything slightly above half pod, and it looks like we're trying to get value now. So we're betting 550 here to win 1580. Our bet needs to work as a pure bluff 35% of the time. So we're gonna round up. So what does that mean? What's the next thing I'm going to say, guys? If our bet needs to work as a pure bluff 35% of the time, what does that mean for our opponent? Let's see if anyone puts it in the chat. Yes, Ami was the first one. MC, Luis, Casey, ooh, I love how you guys have the fundamental. He needs to defend with 65% of his hands. However, if we throw a queen out there and look at the statistics, we find that he doesn't even have a pair 45% of the time, which means even if he defends with every pair and draw, he's not defending 65% of his hands. He's only defending 55% of his hands. I love this play because most guys will call with a high card or a gut shot once versus a small bet because probably they should. But then on the turn, when they miss and you fire a quote substantial bet out there, they'll let it go. What they don't realize is they're getting worked. I totally did, I totally just did air quotes when I said the word substantial, by the way, <laughs> as if you guys could see. All right, one more, guys. I don't have much time today, so I'm going to have to be brief. There's one other bet you can do here. I only use it maybe 10% of the time, but I'll use it with a young guy who's getting angry with me. I love these in Planet Hollywood tournaments, small events in Europe, WSOPC events. Let's see if you can get this. This also works on online too. You get a lot of LOLs in the chat. All right, guys, what do you think it is? I'm not giving you any training wheels. You got a guess today. A lot of people guessing min bet. One person guessed check. One person guessed over bet. What do you think it is? Mikey goes, whatever it is, don't check. All right, time is up. You can just bet a little 850 there into the pot of 630. So you bet 850. Guys, how do I figure out how often this needs to work? If this were poker 101, this is the first thing they would teach you. You do 850 divided by 1480. That means our bet as a pure bluff needs to work 57% of the time. So what does that mean, guys, for our opponent? I'm gonna pause here for a second. If you haven't thought about it, think about it. It means he needs to defend with 43% of his hands. The problem is if he defends with any pair, that's only 35% of his range. This is a fun, uh, for those of you who are familiar with baseball, I call this the change up, just because nobody expects it. And you get, with young guys, I love this play because you get a lot of poof and then they fold, which is fine. I, I'm, I'm fine looking dumb, right? But it's been a long time since I did this bet and somebody figured out what I was doing and they decided to raise or something. Because most of the time in the States, I, I don't know why this is, but most people, as long as you don't leave them looking stupid, they'll fold. That's at low and middle stakes. And if it's like a WPT in Baltimore, that's a lot of satellite winners and stuff like that, right? Despite it being a more substantial buy-in, it's gonna be people that generally play 500s and 400s and stuff like that. So. As long as you're not 
as long as you're allowing them to save face, they'll usually let it go. And in this case, in common poker parlance, you're kind of seen as the nut case here. So it's not really on them to feel silly. Some final notes, guys. Everything we looked at had to do with the big blind calling you. We started with that situation because it is the most common continuation betting setting in No Limit Hold'em. Do not do these bet sizes versus a cold caller. I'm going to repeat that. Do not do these bet sizes versus a cold caller. A 12% cold calling range is much different than a 35% big blind flatting range. So this is a common misconception that comes up every time I teach this, which is, oh, betting really big to fold out high cards is good versus the big blind calling you. I guess it's pretty good all the time. Well, I'm really glad that you understand now that the big blind calls with too many hands and is on most boards is going to have mostly high cards and you can get away with a really big bet. But that's because they're calling with 35-40% of the hands, almost regardless of where you raise. That's why we're focusing on that spot to begin with, it, which is go count the number of times the big blind calls you and it's just you and him in any medium stakes tournament. It's going to be 30, 40, 50 of your final hands by the end of the tournament. So you really need to have that spot down. Now, if somebody cold calls you in mid position, this is a much more rare spot because usually if somebody cold calls you in mid position, now the big line's gonna flat you so it's a multi-way pot, in which case you should not see that as a complete bluff because the majority of the time, both players have not, have not missed. But if you were to get cold called and the blinds folded, the cold caller only has like 12% of hands. That is a third of the hands the big blind has. Do not fire big. Uh, a buddy of mine was nice enough uh, to start telling me, it, to start teaching me what the solvers say. The solvers are much bigger on small bets versus the cold calling ranges. But to make sure that these large bet sizes are a good idea, I've been taking lessons on GTO solvers and we've been testing bigger bets. Uh, this is just something I pulled from the website, by the way. Don't look, uh, read too much into this. Versus big blinds, versus big blind calling ranges, they do look pretty good. The bigger bets, uh, the solver does not say that though about c betting into cold calling ranges. That's a more varied approach, approach, a much more nuanced approach. What boards should I attack? Uh, this guy's I would take a screenshot of. If, uh, if you would like to. What boards should I attack? Ace high boards should get a small bet because he's either got the ace or he doesn't. So I know it's tempting to read this really quickly as I'm talking, guys, but I'd really encourage you just to listen to me right now because we're going to go through a bunch of different boards and how you can attack them. Since I don't have that much time today, uh, I... I'm going to go through this a little bit more briefly than I would prefer to, but this stuff is very important. So on an ace high board, what is the most exploitative way to play? Well, when you have a really good ace, bet 80% of the pot, because if he has an ace, he's not folding ever. And that pot is going to be so big by the river and he's going to have a really hard time folding, right? And if he has second pair, what usually people do when they have second pair on an ace high board is they'll call they'll call flop and they'll full turn because they assume the second time you fire you have the ace so that first bet should be really big now if you have nothing and again this guy doesn't know you from adam and or this is just someone you don't play with every day or somebody you're running into in a tournament what you can do is bet like one third pot because that bet needs to work 25 percent of the time but that means your opponent needs to defend 75% of the time. That is very unlikely to happen. The really good thing about A side boards is there's no way for your opponent to have over cards. So they usually just have the ace or they don't have it. And if they do have something like 10 9, uh, there's no way for that to be over cards or anything. So any bet will usually fold them out. Unless, of course, they picked up like a gut shot in the backdoor draw or something. But the vast majority of a cold calling range in the big blind is not going to have that. Uh, two cards nine or higher should also receive a small bet. So people tend to cold call with high cards. They don't call with medium cards. They don't, 
they don't really like low cards. It's some medium cards and a lot of high cards. So when you see a board with two cards that are nine or higher, that tends to be a little bit covering the cold calling range, right? So here's the thing. On those boards, let's say the board comes king, queen, two. A lot of the same things apply that apply on ace high boards. Uh, the person has a really hard time having high cards. The only high card there is an ace. Uh, so there's not, we don't have to worry about big combo draws, having to price them out. The person usually has a king or a queen or they don't. So again, a very small bet will work. If let's say the person cold called you in middle position, that might not be the best board to see that because that is all over the person's cold calling range, right? You might want to back off there, but in the big blind, there's still enough like nine, six suited and 10, eight off suits in order to justify a small bet, maybe not half pot. Uh, three cards, nine or below with no straight draw can handle any of the bets we saw today. That is uh, one of my favorite boards. I like to sucker people in with that really small bet, get the like, okay, I don't know what you're doing call and then get them to fold on the turn because that's just an extra 200 ships in my pocket. And if you ratchet that up, if you collect those throughout the day in a tournament, that's going to add up to, let's say, nine big blinds at the end of a tournament. That doesn't sound like much, but everybody listening to this has likely come back from nine big blinds at some point in a tournament and made a really serious run of it if they didn't win the tournament. So having that extra nine big blinds is like having a second life in tournament poker. And as you can imagine, if everybody else enters the tournament with one life and you have two lives, that's excellent. So the, these are the fun, most fun boards to manipulate. You can throw in that over bet if you have a pissy young kid. Uh, you can just go for the bigger bet if you just want to spell it out for them. Uh, you can sucker them in with that small bet and then a big bet. Uh, one Broadway, two low cards can handle the same thing generally. Uh, so that's like King XX, Queen XX, uh, Jack XX. Now, if you have a nine in there, right, if it starts putting flush and straight draws out there, uh, you might not want to get as cute with the small bet, but generally the bigger bets will work. But yeah, if it's just king four two, again, you can do the over bet, you can do the one third pot size bet, you can do two thirds pot size bet. And flush or straight boards, uh, this is something I don't hear talked about enough, but Flusher straight boards are great for double barrels. So get some money in the middle on the flop. You th That is one of the very few situations I really like a half pot bet because what happens is, is someone has a pair of any type on a flush draw board or a straight draw board, they're still going to call if you fire the C bet. They're just going to hope like hell if the card comes out there on the turn that you're just going to give up. So you fire half pot. The person's going to miss the board enough on three to a suit, as long as it doesn't have two cards, nine or higher, three to a suit or three to a straight, seven, six, five. They're going to have missed enough to justify the half pot size bet. But if they do call and the turn is an eight on the seven, six, five board, or the turn is a fourth heart on the three heart board. What happens is they have missed that turn. They did not make a draw 60% of the time minimum. So pretty much any bet out there is going, if you think it's going to fold out the pairs, is going to turn a profit. So you can fire a little bit more substantially and just pocket what they put in on the middle. So the problem I find when you bet one third pot on those boards is you kind of tell the person, I don't have a big hand. Because if you think about it, if the board came seven, six, five, and you had a set of sixes, you really, it's really unlikely you'd be betting one third pot because you'd be justifiably a bit worried about a straight draw coming in, right? So if you bet half pot, it still looks like you could have a little something. And then you get to pick up a little extra money when you bet the turn. All right, guys, that is exactly how much time I had. Hey guys, thank you for tuning in today. I know your time is valuable, so it means a lot to me that you would share time with me today. I promise you I use all these plays myself, and I guarantee they will get you some chips on the felt if you use them. So do be sure to use them. Actually, now that we're at the end, do you mind if I tell you about a deal we have going on? Type one in the chat if you're fine with that.
Lots of ones. Spamming the ones. Well, I'm glad you guys asked. All right, a number of ones, so let's do it. I have a special offer for you guys in regards to poker coaching, where myself, Jonathan Little, and Matt Affleck work. PokerCoaching.com, what is PokerCoaching.com? PokerCoaching.com has over 400 interactive poker hand quizzes, over 30 coaching challenge webinars, four new hand quizzes every week, and you get to attend a live coaching challenge webinar with two-time WPT champion Jonathan Little every month. So, guys, uh, just speaking to you frankly, I cannot tell you how cool the hand quizzes are. I, I get to make hand quizzes for PokerCoaching.com and it's really fun as a coach because coaching people is the best way to do it is in a question and answer format because, well, there's a lot of research in this, which is if you think about the best teacher you had when you were in grade school, usually what that teacher did is get you, got you involved. That teacher would ask you questions all the time and would get you thinking and would get you engaged. And the really cool thing about PokerCoaching.com with those 400 quizzes is that it's just street by street in all these different situations and it's what would you do and you get a score and if you do great awesome you get to hear why the coach did it and hopefully you can uh add on to why you did that and maybe restructure why you did that play a little bit different and get some clarity and if you didn't do well on it you get to know exactly what you want to work on and you get to listen to the coach explain it to you that is the best way to teach and the fact that they have 400 interactive poker hand quizzes is pretty staggering. Just being one of the guys on the back end, knowing how much work goes into just creating one of them, that is, and how useful just one of them can be. Just one can help you see a concept that'll make you win the same type of situations pot again and again and again for the rest of your life, however many decades you think you're gonna be playing this game. It is really staggering what 400 could do. And then you have all the coaching challenge webinars and the hand quizzes. And yeah, Jonathan Little teaching you is the guy you want uh, to be teaching you, Mr. Seven Figures at the WPT. Uh, you also get access to floattheturn.com for free. PokerCoaching.com now includes access to floattheturn.com. Uh, with your free floattheturn.com membership, you get access to 786 poker training videos covering sit and goes, tournaments, and cash games. Uh, I actually didn't know about that till just recently, and I kind of had my head explode when I heard it. That's over 400 hours of poker videos to stream on demand or download for offline viewing. You'll have access to floattheturn.com for as long as you're a member of pokercoaching.com. So, poker videos obviously come in all shapes and sizes and getting float the turns, just the stuff they do is really staggering to have that thrown in on top because you want to get to know the flow of how someone does things. You, that, that is something you do get in the videos and you get to hear a lot of breakdown and analysis and that, that is really fun. And you do get up to 10 free videos worth $970 for free. So yeah, that's uh, you could get up to 10 of them, uh, nine, 90, worth $97 each. So it would take 50 reward stars. And it's, uh, well, let me just read these out. You can get a bonus, two free poker training videos worth $97 each with 10 reward stars, which will be added to your pokercoaching.com account. You can use them to redeem two free videos. Uh, and it's the same thing for the five, for the 10, uh, obviously though for 50 with the 10. And you can browse the training videos that you can redeem with your reward stars at pokercoaching.com slash rewards. I've seen some of the ones that can be redeemed. They're very high tech. Uh, re Jonathan, okay. Just kind of speaking off the cuff, guys, there's very few people in my business where, like Jonathan, who will just get other people on the phone and we'll get stuff together and we'll get concepts down. 
about all different facets of the game because not everything is going to work for everybody, right? What he contacted me about is low and mid stake stuff, right? So I work, all, the thing I really liked about John is he contacted me about the exploitative stuff, right? And that was a different field of study than a lot of things that also get taught in poker. So it's, there's a lot of different poker videos on a lot of different topics that help everybody with everything you can imagine in poker. And they're all available. You can check them out at pokercoaching.com slash rewards. So what you're going to get, let's do the breakdown. If you get the three-year option, 400 plus interactive hand quizzes, 400 times of $5 is a $2,000 value. Also get 30 plus challenge webinars. Those go for 29 bucks a pop, so that's an $870 value. Four new quizzes every week for three years. So that's 624 new quizzes at five bucks a pop. That's $3,120 in value. And you get to attend a live webinar every month for three years. 36 live webinars at 29 bucks a pop. That is $1,044 in value. So bonus number one, 400 plus hours of training videos on floattheturn.com. That's, it's normally 10 bucks a month times 36 months. That's $360 in value. And bonus number two, 10 free specialized training videos, $97 each, so that's a $970 value. That total value is $8,364. But with the deal we got going today, well, <laughs> just before we got that, let's do some math. It's normally 39 bucks a month for poker coaching. So over 12 months, that would be $468. Over 24 months, that would be $936. Over 36 months, that would be $1,404. But with the t deal we got going on today, it's just 299 bucks for three years, guys. It's 249 for tw two years and 199 for 12 months. And you can learn all about that at pokercoaching.com slash lucky. That website, one more time, guys, is pokercoaching.com slash lucky. Use that coupon code lucky to get everything for just 299, the total value of $8,364 for 299, pokercoaching.com slash lucky thank you guys for tuning in i really appreciate your time and i really appreciate you allowing me to discuss this deal i'm here to answer any poker questions you may have uh up until the time my girlfriend calls me for dinner so let's go ahead and look into questions thank you guys for tuning in by the way so joe batterman asks would you agree that limp callers are also good targets for the strategy we're using against the big blind? Yes, Joe, you need to make sure they don't limp big hands though. So typically if the person's under 50 years old, you're fine, right? Because young guys just won't try that play, even though that play can work pretty well. I have a buddy of mine who makes that play work really well when there's a kid at the table who just isos everything. And uh, yeah, he's good with it. Uh, Mike says, can we get a webinar on heads up or near the end of the tourney? Would like to know more on shoving and calling in those situations. Mike, uh, actually, Float the Turn has a really good app on shoving. And if you want to win more tournaments heads up, just play your big pots in position. Mike says, hey, Alex, I just want to say a huge thanks for answering all my emails. Happy to be of service, Mikey. This is my day job and I have a pretty awesome job playing poker and teaching about poker. So it's really honestly my pleasure. <laughs> Somebody wrote an end joke here. Ha ha, Ralph. <laughs> Will says, master tournament poker in one class has really refined my opening ranges and overall game in a downswing, but feel like I'm not giving my tourney away like I did in the past, which is a huge step. Thanks a bunch. You're welcome, Will. So if you guys are unfamiliar with my coaching, I do do quite a bit of uh, the hand quizzes, the interactive quizzes. 
that we, you would get by accessing pokercoaching.com slash lucky. The, the way I teach people how to play poker is attacking poker. And it's attacking poker with some analytics, some combinatorics, so a lot of the fundamentals. Uh, I find the way we teach poker to be really silly. Uh, I was really lucky in that uh, I learned poker like everybody else in the States uh, from like the training sites and everything back in 2006. And in 2007, uh, to this day, I don't know how this happened, but a bunch of Germans took me in in Malta. And just getting to be around how they thought about poker, I learned a new set of fundamentals and my life has pretty much been awesome ever since. And the way they teach are the... The stuff we were studying at that time, I, I don't even know. They're very modest guys, If how much they would claim is their own idea. But it was very much attacking poker. And it came from the chess world, I think, which is if you watch an intermediate chess hustler, he's just a very attacking guy, right? And then you'll see people just get worked over in any game, be it boxing or chess, when they're just waiting for something to happen. Right. Whereas if you go on the attack, a lot of good things can happen. And if you can skillfully go on the attack, uh, you're not going to be giving away your tournaments, as uh, Will just discussed there. You're going to be putting yourself in situations to win. I just got a tweet. Actually, I've been getting a number of tweets from guys just talking about I can feel that I'm the actor now. I'm the one changing the tournament. I'm the one putting myself in a position to win. That's great. That's awesome. Jonathan says, how would you adjust your strategy for live cash games? Uh, I would, well, honestly, poker is pretty much poker if people are reacting the same way. Now, in a lot of cash games you raise from any position, you're not getting to the big blind. It's going to be seven way to the pot, which is fine. You just got to play two pair of better poker. But if you're in the button or the cutoff and you think your opponent is just going to call you uh, with that wide range. It's the same thing. Do you think, Steve asked, do you think a low percentage of players limp with big hands, such as aces and kings? It tends to be a pretty low number. When I did try to research that, it was pretty hard to find. Uh, Will says, how can I get one-on-one -on -one training from you? Will, write me at alex at pokerheadrush.com. I'm actually, I, I just don't have time for one-on-one -on -one poker training anymore. I'm kind of finishing with the students I have and that's going to be it. But yeah, if you, you know, if you write me, I can put you on the waiting list and I can see what I can do. It's, uh, unfortunately, I don't think I can get anybody in. It's just, it's, things have been really busy lately. Uh, Chuck says, at the start of the tournament, what do you look for to assess your opponents? That's a really good question, Chuck. Chuck, the way you're going to learn most about your opponents, show up 15 minutes before the tournament, drink your coffee, and watch their IDs as they go to the dealer. Especially if you're in Europe, you'll get to see every country they're from. And in the United States, there's different hotbeds of poker. So if the guy's from California, if the guy's from Las Vegas, if the guy's from uh, Atlantic City... If you're just looking at their driver's licenses and you see that more likely this guy plays cards every day. Uh, if this guy's from Timbuktu, uh, if this guy's from, I'm trying to think, Walla Walla, Washington, it's a little less likely he's playing high caliber competition every day, right? And a lot of times it'll say like their address and stuff like that, right? So if you get a quick look, right, just act like you're stretching. That's why you're... Uh, Eyes are going that way. You can get a little bit about that. And then uh, uh, young guys tend to be a little feisty, but don't want to look stupid. It's kind of it's kind of harder with the older clientele because they're learning to attack a little bit more. But they're another great way to think about it is the less effort they're trying to show their pushing, the more likely they are to play aggressively. Essentially, if a person dresses up to go play poker or a person dresses presentably, that means poker is still a big event in their lives. That means it's a little bit more likely to be a recreational player or a very, very intelligent pro. 
if the person shows up dressed like fried dog turds, uh, you know, just the, like I dress better in my living room than some of these guys do showing up at a tournament. And that's so bad if a recreational player turns up there. But yeah, you know, the basketball shorts they pissed all over and the, the graphic hoodie and it's pulled over and they haven't shaven in three days. That guy probably wants you to know what an amazing pro he is, right? So that guy is a little bit more likely to attack your sea bets. Now, if a guy just shows up in jeans and like an okay sweater or something like that, that, that doesn't really tell you much. But if the guy's trying to show you how awful he can show up at the table, that's one thing. Uh, Ralph wrote a very long one. Let's see if we can get to this. Uh, Ralph, Alex, I have one question. I'm running into one problem earlier tournament after I crush it 100 plus big blinds triple up then first three rounds. How much do you tighten up or do you this problem lately? I could email if you don't have time today. Thank you for the webinar. Thank you. This has happened so much lately. Am I just running bad? I think I need to become super tight. Is that wrong? Nope. Uh, that is wrong. Uh, let me tell you. You ever watch a horse race? Number one, a horse race will show you the very natural progression of a race, which is the person who's out in the lead at the beginning a lot of the time is not going to be there at the end. I mean, this happens in all sorts of races, right? It happens a lot in distance running. The guy who just burns out at the beginning, everybody's just laughing at. And then come like mile five on the marathon, he starts finding out why that was such a bad idea. But if you do get out to that lead, the idea isn't to let everybody else catch up. I, uh, look guys, I don't play as much live poker anymore. I like internet poker. I like uh, live people kind of know who I am. They go after me a little bit. I also just don't have as much time traveling to travel as I used to. A day out of this office does cost me a decent amount of money, right? And, but when I do play live poker, I just love it because I'm lucky enough to have run deep a lot of times in the last few years, even though I only get to play like five live tournaments a year, whereas before it was like 10, 15, 20. Uh, lucky enough to run really deep in some tournaments. Uh, WPT Atlantic City, I finished in the 20s or something out of the thousand runners or whatever was in the main event. I final table WPT Prague. Uh, I finished in like the 20s or something in uh, WPT Montreal. Got another final table in Montreal. Uh, had a WCP main event run. And it was all very fun. But what people don't see is there's a lot of times like, Ralph, I get a big stack at the beginning and I am nowhere to be found in eight hours. Because the truth is, if there is profit on the table, you got to take it. Because you get a finite number of hands and no limit hold them. Right? And at the beginning of the tournament... Those chips are as, that is as close to a cash game it's ever going to be, right? And a lot of times at the beginning of tournaments, people are just opening whatever the hell they want. Just three bet them, take them to school, corner them. Why do they think they can open in front of you? If, they're, if you're going to three bet and they're just going to go harump and they're going to call you out of position with their entire range, they, it's just a wide open lane. It might bite you in the ass a lot of the time, but that's okay. So what happens, guys, this is what happens when I play tournaments. I have more fun than anybody I know when I go to Las Vegas because this is what happens. One, I'm either there in day four with a ton of chips, having a lot of fun, or three hours after I started the tournament, I'm going to the movies. So guess what happens? After two or three weeks of playing tournament poker, guess who's not that tired? Everybody else, though, they do this crap when they show up to a live tournament. Okay, got to do my best behavior, right? Time to play great poker. And then, at, at like, and I'm talking about, like, intermediate guy who studies poker, guy who knows about poker. I'm not talking about average punter. But this is what a lot of guys do who really care about poker is they resolve to play their best game, which translates to their tightest game, which means they make day two with no chips consistently, or they barely cash, which means by the end of three weeks in a tournament, they are dead tired because they have not gotten one day off, but they never have chips and they're always grinding a short stack. And it's the same binary action, shove or fold every single time. 
If they are going to keep opening garbage, you must three bet them. If they are going to keep limping garbage, you must isolate them. If one guy is gonna keep opening everything and another person is going to keep calling everything, you must squeeze them. You will go out of tournaments early. That is not a problem. That is a symptom of trying. That shows you're going for it. All the dead money goes dead the middle of day two. Chris Whitcomb asked, do you jam 10-10 to an open raise from early position with effective stacks of 40 big blinds from a somewhat active player already in the money 25 le left? Um, uh, to an open raise from EP with effective stacks of 40 big blinds. Uh, you're probably okay, Chris, but I need more information. If, it, if it's a somewhat active player and I'm pretty sure I can put it in, I think you're okay, but I think you can three bet Another thing you could do there, Chris, is just like two X's open. Because most guys won't four bet back with nine nine. That's a very exploitative play, and that could go very wrong with uh really good opponents, but the vast majority of players will not know what you're doing. Oh, uh, let's see. MC, your question is a little too hard to summarize here. So somebody asked a, a question like, how do you close out tournaments? I, I was lucky enough to recently talk with a friend of mine who has made a million dollars profit from online tournaments. And I got to watch his biggest one and see how he did it. And the thing I notice is when he's out of position, he doesn't care. And if he like has a pair and somebody raises him post flop and he doesn't like the spot, he's to stop. He doesn't care. But when he's in position and he likes the pot, I, I have never seen a guy hammer more. He'll three bet you everything, every size he can just to get the three bet on you. And he will value bet every single time viciously. And I, I think that type of execution is how you finish out tournaments because then you come into final tables with more churn, with more chips, which means technically you're going to win more tournaments than the other person. Um, let's see. Joshua asks, uh, how many of the poker hand poker coaching hand quizzes or tournament cash hands. I know John is talking to new people to get new hand quizzes in. I think they're working more on cash. I, To be honest with you guys, I'm not absolutely sure as to the exact percentages, so I don't want to say. Uh, Daryl says, on the dry rainbow low card board where we bet three-fourths pot, how should we proceed if we get called against either a low turn card or high turn? Uh, Daryl, ask a really good question. Uh, let me teach you something that I really wish somebody taught me when I play poker. When you see bet, what everybody, when you ask, why did you see bet there? They'll say to fold out, you know, when he missed. Okay. Great. So when he calls you, what does he have on the turn? He's got pairs. It's like, it's all pairs. <laughs> this actually came up in one of my poker coaching hand quizzes recently which was I was just showing the I I was just showing that like 70% of most of your guys flatting range is going to be pairs. So you need to know what a pair does on the turn and river. And the truth is low stakes guys don't ever want to fold their pairs. Mid stakes guys will fold their pairs if another overcard comes that isn't likely to fill them in and their pair originally was just garbage. But if their pair was anything halfway decent, they're not folding. By the way, guys, this coupon expires Sunday, March 24th, 2019. I forgot to mention that. So act quick. David says, will you be at Shakta for the WPT? I'm not, I'm, you're making me cry, David, no. I have a life project I've been working on and I told myself no poker till it was done. I'm very sad because I love playing poker. I love my job. I still love playing cards. 
It always makes me mad when you hear poker pros go like, snooty, snooty, snoot, snoot. Like, I don't like, <laughs> I don't really like playing poker. It's, well, why do it then? <laughs> you know? I'd love to be out in Choctaw for you guys. I got a few like projects to finish. I'm thinking of just going, I just want to play more, you know? That's the great thing about the internet. It just, they, you turn it on, you go, right? <laughs> Doesn't matter where you are in the world. You can make all the money tomorrow. Be walking down the block in Newark, New Jersey. Mikey Moore says, you always bang on about the fundamentals. How do you determine what you need to study at any given time? Uh, Mikey, I'd really work on C betting theory. I'd really work on three betting theory. I'd really work on opening theory. And like, I'll give you the analytics answer. Most of your opens will be profitable if no one three bets you. So that this is basic stuff. Late position opens are king. If you're on the cutoff though, and you have a button who's just not awake, you should be opening a lot of stuff you normally don't open. Like I don't open king do suited from the cutoff like 90% of the time. But if I've got a button in a live tournament who's indicating when he's gonna fold his hand, I might just open that from the cutoff, right? Getting better at your opens is a really big deal. Finding out when is it unlikely people are gonna three bet you. Hint, small blind, big blind, never three bet enough. Uh, certain buttons will not. People have tells. Ostentatious behavior tends to mean they're folding if they look at their hand pre-flop. Uh, three betting theory, if a guy opens more than 20, 25% of the hands and you three bet and he doesn't four bet, nine times out of 10, he's screwed. Uh, C betting theory, we a lot of the stuff we just went over. And then turn betting theory, river betting theory, it's pretty much he has a pair. Most guys don't want to fold them. If you have a better pair, keep firing. Uh, don't stop until he tells you not to fire anymore until he raises you. And if you can't beat a pair, find a way to get them to fold a pair. And that's not going to happen too often unless a four flush comes out there, four straight comes out there, or a number of draws and overcards come out there. Bob Mitchell says, I really struggle with aggression on flops where I have a flush and a straight draw, especially open-ended or double-gutted. I know I'm a favorite even to a set, but it seems like it rarely works out regardless of the line I take. Thoughts? Bob, I think you've just been stung lately, which happens to everybody. Just so you know, guys, you'll have entire years where things don't go well in poker because the truth is it's really hard to play enough hand. One of the reasons I love online poker is I can play... Uh, 30 hands is about what you play in an hour in live poker. I can play that in... I can play 5,000, 10,000 hands in a day, right? So uh, that... Let's say 5,000 hands, right? Uh, let's say you play 5,000 hands in a day. Let's just start 4,000 hands, okay? In case I'm overshooting my case there just a bit. You can play 4,000, 5,000 hands in an entire WSOP if you play every single event, right? So a lot of times people are like, I'm just running bad. I'm like, well, you've played that situation four times. And like, there's a pretty good likelihood you'd miss four times in a row, right? Right? If you get on the internet and you grind your ass off, you're gonna see yourself get through those swings. If you're playing live though, you just gotta kinda keep your wits about you. How do you keep your wits about you? Well, you have a life away from the game. A lot of guys forget to do that. They have their day job, they have their family, but all they're thinking about is the game all the time. One of the ways I think I've stayed around in the game, went pro in 2006, it is 2019 now, I'm doing just as fine as back then. Uh, I have a real life outside of poker. And that that's not because I don't love poker, it's just you need a break, just perfect break, right? But if you've been thinking about that situation, Bob, if that happened, and, and I mean, this isn't your fault, but let's say you busted out of three tournaments in a row with that, that it would be very normal for you to be thinking about only that for a long time, right? But the problem is now you didn't play those hands four times. You played them 4,000 times in your head, and now you're convinced they never come. It's not true, buddy. There's a book called uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. Really recommend you uh, check out Your Money and Your Brain. 
extremely good to check out. Fooled by Randomness, Anti-Fragile, Skin in the Game, uh, all books by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, all, have, all having to do with randomness and how the human mind deals with it. And the answer is not well. Keith said, asks, advice for combating button straddles when you were in the big blind or small blind. Played this weekend and when I was in the small blind, the button straddle every time. Keith, tune in for the next one of these webinars. I, I'm going to help you out. Short answer is three bet big and then they'll probably call you with 35% of hands and everything we just discussed is going to be applicable. And I'm just going, I don't know how much time I have, guys. I don't know when my girlfriend has dinner done. So I'm just kind of skimming for the questions that will help people the most. Just want to say thank you. You got some good stuff. Just picked up your book, Exploitative Play and Live Poker. It's a great book. Thank you, Omar. It means a lot to me. Mike says, how do you uh, quiz yourself on accurately ranging opponents? Mike, I would just start with, uh, this is everything in poker, guys. Just start small and it's going to open up. Ernest Hemingway, just so you know, this happens to everybody where it's just kind of decision paralysis. Ernest Hemingway got to a point where he was just afraid to write, even when he was very successful. And the way he would cajole himself into writing is he would say just write one true sentence that was it and once he started he got going so just start with one range uh, i would start with big blind flatting ranges just 45 40 35 uh clip out the big hands and see what you can do on each board i'd start with a cold calling range like 12 percent, 13 percent, 14 percent. the suited aces the suited connectors the small pairs uh some of the suited broadways see what you can do with that i'd start with a three betting range uh just Put a couple bluffs in there and mostly value and see what you can do with that. And get a copy of Flopzilla. I find my C-bets generate a lot of folds, which is great when I'm bluffing, but I'm finding it hard to get value from my good hands. Should I be checking more flops with top pair plus or should I find more bluffs since my opponents seem to be overfolding? Um, it seems like you have opponents, Adam, that are very much like a C bet means the hand when he checks, it doesn't mean the hand. So uh, a pot controlling line, and for those of you who follow me, you know I make fun of pot controlling lines a lot. Uh, but a pot control line there would be just perfect. That would work really well. The problem is pot controlling lines just kind of... Uh, you're in a game where people know to attack C bets, you're supposed to be doing it like 30 to 40% of the time, but you tell people that they can check a pair and uh, just play a small pod. And a lot of guys that are very risk averse will turn that into they always check a pair. But it doesn't sound like you're that type of person, so I would work it in. I was once told by one of the best poker players, or I heard this from a poker player who's probably one of the best poker players that's ever walked the earth. Pot control lines were created by great players to make good players suffer. And what he meant, what I gradually found out, is just overuse of them, right? There are times it's amazing. There are games where people just, they think the C-bet means he got it. And if you check, they're like, oh, he doesn't have it. And they attack turn, attack river, and you just collect nicely. There's other games where if you just C-bet every board, they're going to figure it out real quick. So you got to work in that check. But a lot of times guys just want to fold their high cards and they have mostly high cards that so you should fire. Greg, are you considering board texture before attacking with the higher C-bet size? Yes, sir. Two cards, nine or higher. I do not do it. One card, nine or higher. That's not an ace. I will do it. Uh, Doug Brown says, you mentioned sometimes the difference between European and American players. Any generalities between, say, a Maryland Live circuit event in Choctaw? I've never played in Choctaw, so I can't comment, comment but Maryland, uh, they just don't like to fold. <laughs> that's, that's what I've noticed. A lot of limps, so you got to ISO, and you got to... You got to ISO big, and you got a three bet big to get one guy, and then expect to get cussed out. I got called every name in the book in Maryland. But you got to go big. Like, take whatever you think you need to go and go bigger. 
Oh, you mentioned in the past that you're working on Live Poker 102. Got an ETA for that, Mark. I don't know when that's going to happen because honestly, Live Poker 101 was so much work. And what people want me to do seems to be these very focused theory videos now, not just the practice. But I do have stuff for Live Poker that I'm repurposing for something else. So all the stuff that was going to go in Live Poker 102 will see the light of day. So. Keep looking for that. Uh, let's see. And Jamie says, can you do a webinar on what to do when you three bet from the small blind or big blind, get called and miss the flop? Assuming your three bet range is tighter than these positions, can the button not exploit by flattening the position? Uh, Jamie? Tune in for the next one of these. I'll see what I can do. Avaldis says, great stuff, Alex. Alex, are you living in Malta at the moment? Any plans to uh, play a live tournament? Evaldis, I when I moved to Malta, that was 2007, 2008, I want to say. They did not know what a poker player was, to let you know <laughs> how long ago that was. I left 2009. I was 21. I have not been back since. I used to live in St. Julian's. Uh, I can't remember the name of the grocery store I used to live above. Uh, what was that? It wasn't, it was a few blocks away from Pacheville, which I know you probably are familiar with. But uh, no, I live in New York right now. I live in Long Island City, uh, which is right across the water from Manhattan. I'm really happy here. Sure as hell is not cheap, but uh, it's something they say in the United States at some point you have to live in New York. You're supposed to live in California at one point. You're supposed to live in New York at one point. I'd been on the West Coast enough uh, that I wanted a change of pace and I, I just love the East Coast. I, I love the East Coast with every fiber of my being. I, lo I love New York City. I have never been in a more fun city in my life. There's something to do every single night here. You meet people from all over the world. You can get anywhere for two bucks. It's just insane. My mind has grown so much in this city. Just the number of people you meet. They say when you travel, the great thing about traveling is you have to confront yourself because you have to confront other people and you realize all the little biases you used to have and uh, subtle prejudices and thoughts that you didn't really ever check before. And they all become fatally wounded when you travel because then you're staring at the face of someone who is quite human and you realize where you were biased before. And in New York, you just get that times a million every single day. <laughs> there is everybody here and you better get with it or you're out of here. Uh, Chris says he ran up almost 300 big blinds in a $400 tourney using your three bet tricks. That's what I like to hear, Chris. Guys, I can hear my girlfriend finishing dinner, so I'm probably going to have to run. Uh, let me see. Carlos, you are welcome for writing your emails back. Ralph said 150 an hour, not good enough. It has nothing to do with the money. It's all about the time, dude, as far as me personal coaching. I love personal coaching. I get a lot of ideas from personal coaching. I become a much better poker player with personal coaching. I get to train a lot myself personal coaching because I've got, I put you guys through the worst simulators on hell and I have to know the answer. But it's just not working lately. What kind of adjustments are you making facing opens from clear recreational fun players? Are you flatting more three betting your normal range? Uh, I got to see what they open. They open a dry ace or like a suited gapper or something like that or just an unsuited Broadway, then I'm three betting. If I don't see anything, I'm just flatting. It's really hard to know when a recreational player opens. Steve says it's a dangerous move to limp with aces and kings. Yes, it is. Richard says, lately seeing a lot of people limp ace, ace, king, king all the way to the river and zoom. Is this just something people are doing now? I have no idea. That is different. Uh, Carlos says, are you playing tournaments? Uh, are you playing 
tournaments nowadays. Uh, not as much as before. I do like the anonymous network. Goes on uh, some places where people know where I am. It turns into let's three bet the poker coach. And yeah. Ami says, oh, someone asks where I'm located. We just, Mr. Zolotel, I just, just answered that. <laughs> I appreciate you asking that. So I don't feel as if I just went off on a rant. Uh, do you have different percentages of how the field reacts based on buy-in size or is it more regional? It tends to be more regional. It, it's strangely regional. But it, it tends to be like, it, it, essentially Vegas is different than the rest of the states. It is, is it. Vegas and LA are different than the rest of the states, right? So... Like 1K and higher in Vegas, you're going to get some gunners. Whereas you can play a 3.5K on the East Coast and you're usually okay. Unless you go to like, let's say Montreal. Why would Montreal be different? Because they have access to poker stars. So it's like, if you can imagine somebody who's able to practice piano six hours a day versus someone who can only practice piano half an hour a day, who is going to become the better pianist within a few years? And the thing is, when people have access to PokerStars.com, not saying that's the softest site on earth, but they have a lot of ability to practice. Whereas for many people in the United States uh, who don't want to play on an unregulated site, they feel the only option they have is live poker. And that means they can only play very few hands. Um, let's see, guys. I think I have to head out here in just a second, guys. Uh, Scott said, you said earlier that you open very little these days and three bet much more. Does this mean you are limping first and waiting for someone else to open so you can three bet them? That's a, it's a very interesting play that's really hard to make work. I have had that one blow up in my face numerous times. But no, what it means is I still open a lot of hands as long as I think they're going to play well multi-way. And I just assume it's going to be a multi-way pot. You can also go for a really big open in some games, and then a lot of times it will just go around to the big blind, who with the big blind Annie feels like they just have to call him now. So that can work too, but if that doesn't work, well, uh, God, there's so many different ways to approach that, Scott. You're, you're talking about the stuff I have the most fun with. So the other thing you can do is like 2x if there's a guy that just never stops 3 betting, and then everybody calls, and then that the dork uh, squeezer will squeeze there and then you can just min 4x and what they'll do is they'll just call like really quick when they don't have it uh, <laughs> and when they do have it they have to think about it because obviously uh, they have to decide whether to trap or five bet and then you just cleared everybody out and you got the dork with the jack seven suited all to yourself with all this dead money but again that's a really hard one to pull off uh, Warlock says, isolating when you have an open limper and three plus limp behinds is brutal. I go to 1x per limper plus 3.5x the big blind and still wind up being multi-way. Can't go larger without committing way too much on my stack, which is an effective shove on any pair. Better to limp behind when this happens or just fire large and go for it. If you can short stack by Warlock and even 40x is what I'm talking about, you could actually affect a very good jam there in a lot of those. And then... You can just keep, God, hold on. I'm trying to, sorry, girlfriend's about to call me. So, <laughs> hold on. I think I've gone over time already. I usually just fire large and go for it, though, is the thing. And there, there are some wonderful opportunities for short sackers there. Really recommend you get a copy of Cardrunner's EV and play with that. It's really easy to program jams on Cardinals EV because it's just everybody has to fold or jam on top. I mean, not easy. It takes some time, but it, you'll find if people just don't limp in a big hand, which is there are games where people like wear that on their faces. They'll tell it to you to your face. Uh, you can really work that. Uh, okay. Ralph says he loves this. Thank you. 
Thanks for doing the webinar. How do I adjust to players who like to raise my C bets? Bet only for value, three bet for them. Um, usually the typical raising range I've found, most people will not raise less than two pair. One of the hardest things as a coach is teaching people to raise a pair for value and trying to get them to bluff is very difficult as well. And I used to think, well, that's only because I'm dealing with very dedicated players. Now that I've talked to thousands upon thousands of poker players, I realize people just don't like to raise with nothing. Uh, they really don't like to raise with pairs because if they get three bet back, it's like, crap, <laughs> what do I do now, <laughs> right? So it tends to be two pair or more. So nine times out of 10, it's all in your head, William, uh, if people are raising as a bluff. Uh, now, if you do have someone who has, like, let's say a check raise of like 20% or more or a raise a uh, C-bet of like 20% or more, well, now something you can do is kind of track what boards they like. Guys tend to have their type of board. Uh, like a, a Some guys really like dry boards. Some people really like coordinated boards. No caddy will actually keep track of every time they do it for you. So you can just watch on a replay. Uh so that's really neat. And then if you figure out their board, just, you know. The other thing, if you can watch the replay, is you can see if anybody ever three bet them and they fold, and that, that's their board nine times out of ten. And then you should three bet. And Ami says, I bought my used Tommy Bahama vacation shirts for wearing during the WSOP. God love you. Uh... That's awesome, Lamy. What adjustments do I have to make, if any, in the later stages of the tournament? Oh my God, Ricardo, that could fill a book. I think we talked about that earlier, just a, a lot more hounding people. It all comes back to position. At WCP, what level would you not employ these strategies as much? 2,000 and higher? 1,500, still a lot of this stuff works. Or like anything beyond 2,000. I don't know how many they have there. Are you playing the WCP this summer? At least the main. I never miss the main. I don't know much else of that. I Oh, will I play events at other... Yeah. More about the money. Don't really care about winning a bracelet. I don't know if you're supposed to say that. It'd be neat, but... Let's see... What would your strategy be with ace ace or king king under the gun when you preflop three bet and you have three callers behind you? You can usually stagger your bet sizes to get three streets from a lesser pair because a lesser pair in that big of a pot will not raise you. And if they raise you, usually they're telling you they got it. It's hard to find guys that'll raise in multi-way boards as a bluff. Multi-way pots as a bluff are called with the intention to raise on the turn as a bluff. Uh, well, guys, I think I got to wrap this up. Jeff said he just watched my battle. Thank you, sir. Oh, God, there's a lot of you guys today. I'm so sorry I can't finish this. There is, like, there's another, yeah. Anyways, guys, I do have to run. My, my girlfriend has dinner on the table. I don't want to be disrespectful. I really appreciate you. Uh, showing up today. I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate you guys listening to what I have to say. I really appreciate that. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you had a good time. Uh, yeah, this is Alexander Fitzgerald or Assassinato signing off.